Would you please stand? The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Together let us pray. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hidden. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. <coughs> Dear friends in Christ, God is steadfast in love and infinite in mercy, welcoming sinners and inviting them to this table. Let us confess our sins confident in God's forgiveness. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. <clears throat> Almighty God, have mercy upon you. Pardon and deliver you from all your sins. Confirm and strengthen you in all goodness and keep you in eternal life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Merciful God, by the death and resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, you created humanity anew. May the power of his victorious cross transform those who turn in faith to him, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our opening hymn is number 345.
be seated as we attend to God's word to us through the reading of Holy Scripture. The reading today is from Isaiah 43, verses 16 to 21. Thus says the Lord, who makes a way in the sea, a path in the mighty waters? Who brings out chariot and horse, army and warrior? They lie down, they cannot rise. They are extinguished, quenched like a wick. Do not remember the former things or consider the old things. I am about to do a new thing, new in springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. The wild animals will honor me, the jackals and the ostriches, for I give water in the wilderness, rivers in the desert, to give drink to my chosen people, the people whom I form for myself, so that they might declare my praise. The word of the Lord. Psalm 126, we'll say it responsively. When the Lord returned to the fortunes of Zion, then were we like those who dream. Then our with laughter, and our with joy. Then they said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us, and we are glad indeed. Restore our fortunes, O Lord, like the water courses of the natives. Those who sow with tears will reap with songs of joy. Those who go out weeping, carrying the seed, will come again with joy, shouldering their sheaves. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost. A reading from the letter of Paul to the Philippines. If anyone else has reason to be confident in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day, a member of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. Yet whatever gains I had, these I have come to regard as lost because of Christ. More than that, I regard everything as lost because of the surpassing value of knowing Jesus Christ, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of things, and I regard them as rubbish, in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law. But the one comes from faith in Christ, the righteousness from God based on faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the sharing of his suffering by becoming like him in his death. If somehow I may attain resurrection from the dead, not that I have already obtained this or have already reached the goal, but I press on to make it my own, because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Beloved, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but this one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on towards the goal for the prize of the heavenly call of God in Jesus Christ. 
The word of the Lord. Our gradual hymn this morning is number 177, verses 1 and 2 before the gospel, verses 3 and 4 after the gospel. be with you. And also with you. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to John. Glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, the home of Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. There they gave a dinner for him. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those at the table with him. Mary took a pound of costly perfume made of pure nard, anointed Jesus' feet, and wiped them with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume, but Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, the one who was about to betray him, said, Why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii and the money given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. He kept the common purse, and used to steal what was put into it. Jesus said, leave her alone. She bought it so that she might keep it for the day of my burial. You always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. The Gospel of Christ. I speak to you in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. In this season of Lent, one of the reasons that we have this season year after year, one of the reasons that we make this Lenten journey year after year, is so that we have the opportunity to re-engage with some discipline. Discipline not in the sense of worldly discipline, but that discipline of the kingdom of heaven, that discipline which Jesus lived and taught, that discipline which brings us closer to God. 
And the readings today touch on this discipline. And what we see and hear and read in Isaiah and in Paul's letter to the church at Philippi and in the gospel reading today is a discipline of radical humility and a discipline of radical hospitality. Things that Jesus lived and taught. The humility is not just about equality, but of a radical equality. No one is better or more important than anyone else. Jesus himself lived and exemplified that. He said, the teacher is not greater than the student. The student is not greater than the master. Paul, in his own words, said that in Christ there is no east or west or north or south. There is no Jew or Gentile. There is no slave or free. They're easy words to read and easy words to say. But for us, in terms of living those words, they can be hard to swallow. It's even harder for us to live them out. Most of the time, we end up sounding something like what Paul starts off with in the reading today from his letter to the church at Philippi. Sort of a, to use the common term these days, it's kind of a humble bragging. As he lists off all of his great accomplishments and those things that demark him for who he is. He even leaves a few things off of that list. Notably that he's a, a Roman citizen, so that gives him the freedom to move anywhere within the Roman Empire that he so chooses. And that as a tent maker, and not a tent maker like camping tents of today, but rather you know, great pavilion tents used by the rich and the powerful. But he lists these off, all of these reasons why he is special, why he is more important. And so sometimes we find ourselves listing off all of those reasons why we are special and important. And in a way, it's saying why I am great and why you are not. Reasons to boast, as Paul puts it. The gains of the world. And so therein comes the discipline. A discipline of radical humility. Because when Paul says that he has come to regard all of those worldly gains as loss, he means loss because those worldly gains take him further away from God. And so it's in overcoming the ego and engaging with that radical humility that allows us to come to see God at work in and through those whom we meet, including and especially those whom we, we might not like, those whom we might not agree with, those who maybe look and act differently than we do, and even those who might offend us. And perhaps most difficult for some, considering that God works in and through us. So when we are able to get over ourselves, to get past our own ego, to see God in that way, then we can com come close to God and we can allow God to come close to us. And that radical hospitality flows from the humility because when we are able to see another person as the embodiment of the image of God, remembering that we are all made in God's image, and when we are able to see the Holy Spirit of God indwelling in another person, then we are able to offer them hospitality. But a hospitality as though we were offering it directly to God, as though we were welcoming Jesus himself. 
when we can see and recognize that. When we can see and recognize that in and through those whom we meet, including and especially those whom we might not like, those whom we might not agree with, those who might look and act differently than we do, and those who maybe even offend us. When we can get over ourselves, past our ego, to see God in that way, then we can come close to God and we can allow God to come close to us. Paul's words from the closing part of today's reading are so articulate. Not that I have already obtained this or have already reached the goal, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Beloved, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but this one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus. The prize is not the earthly glories of the world. It's not the gains of the world. But Paul calls it. He says that the prize is this heavenly call. It's this service to each other in the name of God. The prize is being able to welcome one another in the name of God. In a sense, the prize is to sit at God's right hand or God's left hand, but not in the sense of an earthly throne, but rather sitting at a table to break bread and to share wine with loved ones and strangers alike. It is as though sitting at our own breakfast program downstairs and seeing God on your right and on your left sitting at the table with you. It is kneeling together in this house of prayer and taking the bread and the wine, seeing God on your left and on your right, and knowing paradoxically that the kingdom of God is both achieved and attained and that at the same time, we still have a lot of work to do in living out that radical hospitality and that radical humility every day of our lives. So as we near the end of our season of Lent, as we near the end of this year's journey and reminder of the discipline that allows us to follow in Jesus' footsteps, we thank St. Paul for his wisdom and grace. We thank the church for the rhythms of life that remind us of how we need to live with and for each other and with and for God. We are reminded of our need for that radical hospitality and that radical humility so that we may continue to gain the prize of serving God and Christ in each other. Amen. Let us kneel or sit. Let us confess our faith of our baptism in the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
Please kneel or sit for the prayers of the people. As God's new people formed in Christ Jesus, let us join in prayer to God who makes all things new, saying, O God, our Savior, hear our prayer. Draw your church more deeply into the reality of Christ's sufferings so that everyone whom you have called in him may show forth the power of his resurrection. O God, our Savior, hear our prayer. Renew the spirit of hope in every human society and nation. Invigorate us, that we may straighten forward to the future you promise. O God, our Savior, hear our prayer. Show your mercy to those who are held back by infidelity to your plans and free them to receive the, your word of life. O God, our Savior, hear our prayer. Rescue from fear those who are deprived of their human needs or their human rights. Give them their share of dignity to confer on all your children. O God, our Savior, hear our prayer. Grant to this assembly a heart open to your words, that we may embrace your promise, heed your commandments, and declare your praise. O God, our Savior, hear our prayer. Almighty God, the giver of all good gifts, give your grace, we humbly pray, to all who are called to preach the mission and message of Jesus Christ. Martha, our rector, Scott, our associate priest, Michael, our bishop, Colin, our metropolitan archbishop, Fred, our primate, and Justin, the archbishop of Canterbury. For the millions of refugees and displaced people, for churches and groups welcoming refugees to our country, and all those preparing for sponsorship. The flowers on the main altar are in the memory of Ina Landwall by her son, Donald. In our own congregation cycle, we pray for the health and happiness of the Wilson, Wood, Yano, Young, and Ames families. We also pray for those members of our congregation who are suffering from medical or mental health problems and have asked of our, for our prayers that they will be restored in body and mind. Jennifer, Reed, Andrew, Susan, Daniel, Ralph and Carol, Carolyn, Sheila, Terry, Rochelle, Carla, Mary, and Angela Harris. God, our Savior and Redeemer, you are constantly at work bringing new things to your creation. Hear the prayers we make to you and continue to perform ever greater wonders for the entire family of humankind. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our time of prayer and reflection continues as our choir offers an anthem.
Our offertory hymn is number 179, and note that it is actually verses 1 to 5 and 6F. 6F is the verse for the fifth Sunday of Lent, so verses 1 to 5 and 6F, hymn number 179. Eternal God, your only Son suffered death upon the cross to bring the world salvation. Accept the praise and thanksgiving we offer you this day in the name of Jesus Christ, the Lord. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. We give you thanks and praise, Almighty God, through your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Redeemer. He is your living word, through whom you have created all things. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he took flesh of the Virgin Mary and shared our human nature. He lived and died as one of us to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. In fulfillment of your will, he stretched out his hands in suffering to bring release to those who place their hope in you. And so he won for you a holy people. 
He chose to bear our griefs and sorrows and to give up his life on the cross that he might shatter the chains of evil and death and banish the darkness of sin and despair. By his resurrection, he brings us into the light of your presence. Now with all creation, we raise our voices to proclaim the glory of your name. Gracious God, accept our praise through your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, who on the night he was handed over to suffering and death, took bread and gave you thanks, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. In the same way, he took the cup, saying, This is my blood, which is shed for you. When you do this, you do it in memory of me. Remembering, therefore, his death and resurrection, we offer you this bread and this cup, giving thanks that you have made us worthy to stand in your presence and serve you. We ask you to send your Holy Spirit upon the offering of your holy church. Gather into one all who share in these sacred mysteries, filling us with the Holy Spirit and confirming our faith in the truth, that together we may praise you and give you glory through your servant, Jesus Christ. All glory and honor are yours, Father and Son, with the Holy Spirit, in the Holy Church, now and forever. Amen. Amen. As our Savior taught us, let us pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We break this bread, communion in Christ's body, once broken. Let your church be the wheat which bears its fruit in dying. Behold what you are, become what you receive, the gifts of God for the whole people of God.
invite you to stand. Merciful God, you have called us to your table and fed us with the bread of life. Draw us and all people to your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Glory to God, whose power working in us can do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine. Glory to God from generation to generation, in the church and in Christ Jesus, forever and ever. Amen. Life is short. And we do not have much time to gladden the hearts of those who travel the way with us. So be swift to love, make haste to be kind. And the blessing of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and those you love this day and always. Amen. Amen. Please be seated for some announcements. We'll start off again with a slew of birthday wishes. Birthday wishes go out this week to Shirley Chamberlain, to Ed Swartz, to Mark Delisio, Cheryl Bergie, Nicole Gignac, and Sharon Sebastian. Let's sing happy birthday. Oh, and Doug Ridge. Doug Ridge's birthday is this week as well, and he didn't tell us. Oh, my goodness. All right, you're included in this too. Happy birthday. God bless you. By the way, just a reminder that, you know, if that happens and we miss your birthday and you're feeling really left out, you need to call our office and tell us your birthday so that we know because, you know, we rely a lot on you to tell us and on Facebook and if we don't get the word from you or from Facebook, then we don't know it's your birthday. So just, uh, we don't mean to leave anybody out, you just need to make sure that we have your birthday listed. I'm going to invite Neil Culp forward to uh, give you an update on the Futures Committee. I'm a little taller. All right. Uh, My friends, I'm in front of you today again uh, to provide you with another update on the currently ongoing St. Catherine's Futures conversation. As a quick reminder, the uh, the St. George's representatives in the process are Martha Teutonic, Pauline Smith, and myself with Paul Chapman as the alternate. As a team, we've decided that after each meeting going forward, one of us will provide you with a verbal update in addition to the meeting minutes that Martha makes available. We feel that it's important for you, the congregation, to be as up-to-date as possible as we move through this process. In addition to providing you with an update on our last meeting with my comments today, I also feel it's important to share some of my, th- uh, some of my thoughts around the context of this conversation. I would actually like to start there. When I gave my first update, I urged you all to get informed by speaking with one of us. And since that time, I've been pleased with the level of engagement. I've personally had several conversations with some of you, and a discussion about the process was a significant part of our vestry meeting in February. In that vestry discussion, and in many of the conversations I've personally had, I think it's fair to say that there is a level of of frustration with the process, which I can well understand. Many of the churches in St. Catharines have been struggling for years with seemingly little concrete being done to solve the issues. The current conversation actually reminds me of some training that I recently delivered at Brock University as part of my role there. The training is designed to help people when the things they have to discuss involve important outcomes, strong emotions, and differing opinions. The training refers to these situations as crucial conversations, and the future's discussion clearly meets this definition. In the training, we teach that to have effective conversations that lead to effective outcomes You must focus on yourself first by ensuring your motives are consistently right and inclusive and that you ensure you're not making assumptions or telling stories about uh, the other parties to the discussion. The key, however, is to ensure that the process is such that everyone involved is comfortable sharing their true perspective. 
without a full picture from all sides, a full and optimal solution will escape any process. When I think on these points, a number of thoughts occur, but the most important when I think about the future of the Anglican Church in St. Catharines is that we all likely want a relevant, thriving, impactful, and sustainable church. To that end, we need to act consistently in a way that leads to that kind of solution and ensures that we, don't have this, that we don't have a need to have the same discussion again in the future. And I'm afraid that simply closing churches that are currently struggling with no other plan in place to solve the underlying problems is not aligned to that goal of a relevant, thriving, impactful, and sustainable church. If all we do is act to address the most obvious symptom, the Anglican Church in St. Catharines will continue to fade, with another serious wound to quicken its demise. So while there is justifiable, justifiable frustration, there must also be patience, as these difficult discussions do take time. I can assure you that everyone present at the Futures Discussions meetings is agreed that right now we have too many properties, and that too much of our annual expenses goes towards sustaining our buildings instead of vital ministries and programs. There is a sense in the meetings that in order to grow, we will likely need to contract to free up resources which can be directed towards much needed um, programmatic investments. To do this thoughtfully though, we need time. And I think that brings us to the update for our last meeting. Our last meeting was held on February 25th, and I would call this meeting a transition point in many respects within the process. The main focus of this meeting was to look back on the time the committee has spent together in order to pair, prepare for our next stage, which is starting to cr actually create the recommendations that will go to the bishop. We reviewed, in order, the focuses and outcomes of the conversations we had to date, reviewing our key takeaways from each of those meetings. This summary helped confirm some of our key conclusions, which I've partially outlined above, and specifically the need to both retract in some respects in order to reinvest and move forward in a sustainable way. Now, I will admit that the process to date has been one that I and many others have been critical of. There have been many missed opportunities and some counterproductive elements. Clearly the process is not perfect. It is, however, resulting in some good work, which is a direct result of the commitment from the people involved in the process. I say that there's good work because after the review of the previous meetings, we began to review potential recommendations and options for the future. The night concluded with a long list of potential solutions to consider, and when I review the options brought forward, many seem to be very helpful and viable options. Given that we are at the point where we are generating options, I would encourage all of you to share with Martha, Pauline, Paul, and myself any suggestions you have to make the St. Catharines Anglican community energetic and sustainable. The next phase of our process will be to organize the identified options and evaluate them to determine which have the most potential to achieve our goals. Finally, the selected options will be dug into in order to assess their actual practical viability. From there, our recommendations will go to the bishop. And at this point, I should point out that it was agreed that some of the work options, if appropriate, may, be, uh, may begin being worked on even before the recommendations go to the bishop. As always, I encourage you to stay up to date on the process, and any one of the team would be happy to hear from you and answer any questions you have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Neil. As well as staying up to date on the process, I ask you also to keep the process in your prayers as the 10 Anglican churches in town continue to meet, and as Neil has so eloquent, eloquently shared with us as we try to discern a way forward in um, making our church across the city strong and vibrant. I'll also make Neil's comments available on our website and in the weekly newsletter this week. Just a couple of other things to draw to your attention. We do have parish council after the service today in the Swan downstairs. You can take a moment to grab a coffee or tea or a goodie and uh, join us downstairs if you're on parish council. Um, we do have a time of fellowship and refreshment following the service. We hope that all of you will be able to join us for that time together. 
There are Easter letters available at the back. We ask that you pick those up. And if you can pick up the Easter letter of one of your neighbors and hand deliver it, that saves us the cost of postage. If you go to the back and find that there is not an Easter letter with your name on it, it could be a sign that you haven't officially signed up yet to be a member at St. George's. And uh, so that would um, maybe be a, a prompt to, uh, to do so. We can certainly help you if uh, you're considering this to be your church home. We can help you with um, officially becoming a member. And Holy Week starts next Sunday. We will have a Holy Week preaching series that will take us from Sunday, March 20th to Sunday, March 27th, Palm Sunday to Easter Sunday, looking at the events of Jesus' last week through the eyes of Mary, the mother, Mary, Jesus' mother. And we do offer daily worship through Holy Week. We have uh, our Monday Thursday service at 12, 10, and 7 p.m. We have Good Friday at uh, noon hour, as well as the Good Friday walk that takes place with all of the downtown churches. It starts next door at Royal House this year. Rather than having a guest uh, speaker, we have guest musicians. A lot of you will know Allison and Gerald from the Advent Cafe. They are the uh, leaders of the Good Friday Walk this year. They'll be leading a reflection and a beautiful piece of music at each one of the stops down Church Street. That starts at 9.45 on Good Friday. Um, the Easter Vigil there's a mistake in the bulletin, which I didn't catch. The Easter Vigil is on March 26th, not the 25th. And we are so pleased that we will have our bishop, Michael Bird, with us for that service. He will be confirming three adult members of our St. George's congregation. And uh, we're so blessed to look forward to that special celebration, followed by a resurrection party and then um, Easter Sunday with all the bells and whistles. Lots of other announcements in the Saints Connection. I hope that you will take time to make note of dates and opportunities. I invite you now to stand for our final hymn, which is number 619. Oh.
one important announcement, so just hold tight for a moment. Tom's going to uh, enlighten us. Thank you, Tom. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. And the peace of Christ be always with you.